it'll be great just to see how the entire industry starts growing and thriving and which ways they take turns. But you also have to be more savvy, especially if you're a new company or you're a new founder or you're just someone new in the ecosystem. Learn where your region is. What is your region doing in terms of policies? And maybe consider that if you're in a region where you may not have the economic power in your domestic market to really play and just feed that, then maybe you need to collaborate more or or maybe that means you need to think of other ways to work together with larger players. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Ao, venture capitalist, serial founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview change makers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 40,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Stay well and stay brave. Grain is an online restaurant that serves healthy yet tasty meals on demand and catering. They are backed by investors, including the Lo and Behold Group, T.E. Tia, Open Space, and Sento Ventures. Their meals are thoughtfully created by chefs with wholesome ingredients. For the month of April, Grain has teamed up with HGH Maimona to bring you a quirky yet delightful experience for the first ever Michelin-inspired catering in Singapore. Learn more at www.grain.com.sg. If you ever need to feed your teams or family, go check out Grain. Hey, morning, Gita. Morning, how are you? Good. We want to talk about one of our favorite topics that we've been discussing recently, which is about green investments and electric vehicles. Obviously, we both have a soft spot for this. For myself, I've been a big supporter. I've built a social enterprise, consulting for a lot of different nonprofits in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Uh, I've been thinking about the green policies for like you know a dozen years since undergrad. How about you, Gita? What's your track record on this? Yeah, actually, I started my career in carbon markets circa 2005. So back then, carbon markets was very wild, wild west, and it's still wild until today. So it's been very interesting just seeing the growth and the entire evolution of it. Also, I started my career with a power company too, almost 20 years ago. And back then, we were exploring renewable energy. And I think, I guess today, Asia region, especially Southeast Asia, definitely are thinking a lot and exploring. The execution is a different question. And I think the reason why we're sharing our, our records here a little bit is because we're going to be very frank about what we think about the space here. And so the first report that we have is that the global management consultancy, Bain & Company, my old employer, recently wrote and it was declared that Southeast Asia is woefully off track on green investments to reduce emissions. So Gita, what do you think? To be fair though, if you even look at a lot of countries, if you look at Australia, if you look at the US, the majority of their energy is still from fossil fuel. It's just that transition for them is going to cost so much more and will just have to be more aggressive than Southeast Asia. I think there's so much hope for Southeast Asia to transition energy simply because for developed markets, it's a lot harder. So so my current work also advising the Coordinating Ministry of Maritime and Investment Affairs, part of it was to help with the Just Energy Transition Partnership or JET. And that's the alliance of GFANS countries financing some of Indonesia's initiative to help us transition to zero carbon electricity grid by before 2060. Again, a lot of the conversations about that was actually about how hard it is for GFANS countries to completely transition themselves without it costing an incredible amount. Whereas for Indonesia, it's still in the realm of some possibility. But again, it's also very expensive because we're not just talking about building renewable energy. We're also talking about early retirement of coal-fired power plants, which you have to pay money for. And people sometimes underestimate how much that costs. Because one power plant, if you pay for early retirement, that in itself is already several hundred million dollars. And you're talking about a country where the GDP per capita is still around 5,000. Therefore, I, I think energy transition basically questions about how do 
you create a more sustainable future is never a one-shot deal or requires only one big solution. It actually requires multiple solutions working together holistically. Yeah. This reminds me, I'm a proud energyist. I'm a card-carrying person in support of more energy consumption. Because you look at Southeast Asia, like you said, we have a low GDP per capita across the region. And a lot of that growth requires energy. You need energy to run manufacturing, to create jobs, to have the internet. And there's a one-to-one -one match between the growth that we need to have for us to lift millions of people out of poverty and the energy consumption. And so I think this report did a great job because they're saying that energy consumption across the region is expected to grow 40% across this decade. But if we continue on this current trajectory, then the region will overshoot their 2030 pledges by 32%. At a very high level, think about that is saying the tricky part is that when we do green investment, even though we are way short of the... So the way that I think about it is that the green investment that we need to do is not just, like you said, to substitute our supposedly current base, but actually is to keep up with the increased consumption over time. And so Bain kind of said, hey, we need $1.5 trillion in this decade. We'd way, 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 way more than what's actually available. And it goes back to it. It's like, where does the money come from? Because that money is being diverted. We talked about it. You care about healthcare a lot. We care about education. There's so many different things to spend it on. And the awkward reality is that we've talked about it, but carbon emissions was high externality things, which goes to the rest of the world. But if you put a dollar in healthcare, you know where that goes. You put a dollar into substituting between your current energy solution and a green energy solution. Actually, there's not much difference. Honestly, you still get the energy that you want from the output system in both systems. It's just that there's less negative externality that ripples out to the world. And I think that's the fundamental crux is that the only way this is really solved is if we get cheap capital out or substitute for that to bring it in. You're 100% correct on that in the sense that when it comes to investing, again, it goes back to risk return profile and then timeline. So as investors, we often think that way. And the problem becomes, what if the timeline is just a lot longer or even the risk return profile is simply not that amazing for the fund or for the investor. For example, it just seems like on paper that the returns don't tick the box or don't make the cut for them. And that is a reality for a lot of types of green investments. It doesn't mean it's not worth it, quote unquote, but it just depends on how you also define what's worth it for the portfolio. And that is where blended finance, for example, can be one of the drivers for that. Because you do need, again, when we say differences in risk return profile, then perhaps one of the type of financing that you need is not necessarily the traditional banks or the traditional financiers, but other types. Perhaps it's philanthropy or grants or even other types of financing. But either way, the problem is very real. No one's saying that you shouldn't. I think you should. But Again, how do you then package the deal itself? How do you create and manage expectations with your financiers? That becomes very complicated very quickly because humans also tend to think quite short term. It's very hard, even with healthcare, it's very hard to say if you invest into nutrition, well, you'll see the benefit in 20 years when it reduces funding by 50%. And a lot of people, when you think of it from a private sector perspective, that's very traditional and go in 20 years, I need to give my returns and I need to show the metrics by next quarter. But also if you look at, for example, leadership and democratic systems, they go, well, what do I have to show for come next election cycle. In three to five years, what can I show? And that's a much harder conversation to have. Yeah. And I think this interacts with the interest rate policy. When zero interest rates were there, then effectively it was like perfect blended finance in the sense that a dollar in a hundred years is the same as a dollar today. So in that case, everybody could fulfill a lot of those renewable energy pledges in that sense, because it felt like cost of capital be low. And so there'll be no cost to substitute for lower return renewable energy plants that have a higher cost structure historically and are a little bit more unproven in our Southeast Asian requirements, which is cloudy, <laughs> there's random stuff happening that needs maintenance, we don't have the engineering stack versus tried and true coal, oil and gas and so and so forth. It's an interesting dynamic where now that we have high interest rates, converse of that, then a lot of these renewable energy plants that have there fundamentally stop looking like they make sense. And that's a tricky part. It goes back to your rate of return versus interest rate versus alternative ways to install energy consumption. We should draw this out as a nice, beautiful formula. You know, those crazy boards. You put the photos on a wall, a cardboard, you pit it. It's like, it all interacts interest rates with rate of return. I mean, I have that in the whiteboard at work. It makes you feel better. So is electric vehicles going to save us? The energy transition program. Oh, yeah. No, why? <laughs> I love the transition. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> oh boy.
Look, oh man. So there's a lot of EV startups coming out the last several years. A lot of it is because of public sector initiatives to drive up EV adoption, but also because Indonesia is focusing so much on downstreaming and industrialization, trying to create the full value add chain for EV. And that's why we're having this influx of EV deals. Yeah. So it makes sense at some level, which is that it's a much simpler thing to manufacture because it's just batteries. So you don't have a lot of the internal stuff. And we're obviously using a supply chain that we have. So we have microchips to represent all the little gadgets and switches and little do that you have in a console. Now you just have a screen. There's a real reinvention of supply chain. And there's a great article by Richard Hatong, a good friend of mine. And he said Southeast Asia is actually the seventh largest automotive manufacturing hub worldwide and produced about 3.5 million vehicles in 2021. Thailand is the largest, producing 1.6 million vehicles, followed by Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. And so I think that's that interest, I would say, why there's EVs, because it feels Southeast Asia knows how to manufacture cars. So now you should be able to manufacture electric vehicles. I think there's a logic gap there, but that's interesting. Let's talk about the logic gap here because I think that's the crux of it. Well, you go first. Why is that logic gap? Because that is the logic what? parallel that we're making here. Wait, right? first of all, this is not to bash EV or anything like that because obviously I do believe that industrialization and creating a full supply chain for Indonesia, for example, is because we have world's largest nickel reserves and we have all of these mineral reserves that we do want to have value add chain to optimize on so that the country can be financially independent and also finally get to a high income country status. I completely understand the logic for that. And I also see that, as you said earlier, that we're already manufacturing cars, so why not EV? But I think the part where it starts getting very challenging is creating an EV production supply chain is creating an entire ecosystem and creating an entire ecosystem is simply way more challenging than a lot of people think. We're talking about countries also where the GDP per capita is under $10,000. And when the GDP per capita is under $10,000, even with the current scheme of increasing adoption by offering subsidies, et cetera, people will still likely buy a motorcycle based on price. It's still price. You can argue that our middle upper class society is getting larger, and it is, but the crux of it is still the mass will find purchasing an EV vehicle challenging. I mean, that's just the current reality and the numbers. EV adoption is still in the single digits right now, correct me if I'm wrong, for Indonesia. And it's just going to be uphill for a while because, again, has to go back to fundamentals, which is what's your GDP per capita. But there is more. And feel free to keep going, Jeremy. So I think what is true is that there is a lot of shared understanding on the marketing of automobiles. And there's a lot of shared industrial interest policy-wise by governments around that because it's a manufacturing job. And so governments are basically saying, hey, I used to do internal combustion engine automobiles and now I want to do electric vehicles. So I think that is shared. What's sure. not shared is the ecosystem. And I started talking about the supply chain is very different. So one way to think about it is that Germany is struggling with this transition right now. So obviously the US, for example, is getting a ton of subsidies through the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, to transition their existing automobiles. And they're also planning to slap on tariffs on Chinese EVs in the future because they want to protect that industry because they feel like they need to protect the industry to convert that. So the industrial policy is the same, but the awkward reality is that fundamental incumbents have to change and everybody's struggling with that issue right now. The Japanese manufacturers are struggling with that and everybody's obviously Asia. And so now to some extent, it's not just a competition of startups, but it's also a competition of the incumbents transforming as a tra transformation and competition at a governmental ecosystem, regional level. That's really difficult. And so I think where you and I are talking about is from my perspective is, am I bullish that electric vehicles will replace all internal combustion engines? For me, I would say yes. In 100 years, maybe 100% adoption, eventually cost will drop, and so forth, technology get better. But the question is, which ecosystem will win? Is it American system versus the Chinese system? And within those systems, can you capture value as a startup or will it be one of the existing quasi incumbents that are there? And I think that's the tricky part because at, at the lowest level for you and I, we've seen a lot of electric vehicle decks and we've been swapping notes as well. And to some extent, the deck makes it seem like it's the company that is the key fulcrum or competitor, but it's not, right? It's one level higher, which is, are you even in the right country or do you have the right industrial policy. And I think that's a really difficult conversation to have. Yeah, you can't change an entire industry necessarily, especially today, just because you're one company that's trying to do right. 
it really does depend on the timing. It really does depend on the country. Where are you located? Can your domestic market handle it? Or if you're not making it for the domestic market, then can you compete with other exporters? Let's say China. And so what we're talking about is in Indonesia, if you are a player, so much of it is really realizing that China is also exporting a lot of their supply chain. Competition is not necessarily just in the finished product. It's in almost every part of the product. And like what you said with Germany and Japan, a lot of these transitions require a combination of private sector funding and also public sector policies. And the issue with countries that are still emerging markets and still young democracies is simply you're very new. So you're building policies almost in a reactive manner. When you see a problem and then you try to build these policies because you're not as old and established and you've had the same policies going and the same infrastructure and systems that have been working. So you're physically making things as they go. So you can see that in tech. A lot of new financial regulations in emerging markets, heck, even in developed markets, they have to struggle with things like social media and fintech because these are new technologies. And oftentimes in public sector, a lot of regulations take years to make. So it makes sense that public and private sometimes end up not running along optimally because they're running at different speeds and they're running with different visions and motives in mind. That's why when you're looking at an entire transition, it really does require so much more than just us as a venture capital really putting in the money. It has to be very holistic. It has to be with the government. There has to be certain types of policies, certain types of reforms. You may have to liberalize some parts of your economic regulations, depending what kind of market you are, depending what kind of manufacturer you are, depending also on your GDP per capita and depending on how you look at your debt to GDP ratio. All of these just become very localized for your market while also realizing that you have incredible competition too. Yeah. That's all. I like what you say, which is, you know, just competing with Chinese finished product that's being exported across borders and maybe subject to tariffs or some level of customs duty. But also the fact is that China is exporting its value chain outside of China. So they're looking to partner or localize or basically set up local production lines that bypass export tariffs, but also satisfy local government requirements for jobs and ecosystem the constituents. And so to some extent, you're fighting against Chinese motorcycles, EV, but also you're competing against what you want to call it a rapper, <laughs> You know, it's a Chinese guts, Chinese knowledge working with Vietnamese engineers and jobs. And a rapper might be some local brand in that sense. But that's the crux for a lot of new breed electronic vehicle startups is that competition across multiple dimensions. So are you competing? Are you partnering? That's why we're starting to see a lot of startups now start to pivot and do a lot more of. So definitely seeing a lot more partnerships come up as they adjust to that competitive reality. Yeah, it's very easy to also paint everything with a very broad brush and then say, oh, is it better if we have only protectionist policies in order to grow your ecosystem? And that really just depends. Probably not necessarily also the best when it comes to transferring privilege and receiving more investment because the problem is climate change is simply just an issue for the entire world. It's not an issue for just one country. The issue with looking at is EV going to save, that is one part of the equation, but it's really only one. There are a lot of other equations you need to question. For example, I started my career learning of carbon credits like circa 2005 and 19 years ago, that was the question that we all faced, which is, okay, if it literally costs more and rewards less to keep a biodiverse forest than to take everything down and sell it, then what are the incentives? And this is hard. There's a lot of questions like, what about the value of nature-based solutions? What about blue carbon and its value? And so it's easy to think that only one sector can quote unquote save us, but the reality is it'll never be just. And so Again, the challenge for anyone, for any country is, can you have an optimal public and private sector partnership where you optimally and holistically create solutions that are multifaceted and also multi-sectoral? And that is ridiculously hard. In general, not just even for emerging markets, it's also hard for developed markets, as we can see. I mean, nobody has cracked it. And what's going to be interesting is the biggest success, and I don't think I predicted this when I was studying energy markets over a dozen years ago, is just how much the union between environmentalism, but also national security and economic industrialist patriotism has created this. I mean, solar cell industry moved and was effectively cloned and localized and honestly scaled 
by an order of magnitude from Germany to China. The truth is solar cell in many parts of the world is actually cheaper than local carbon emitting forms of energy. So it's really tremendous they're doing that. And one prediction I was chatting with you and I want to share is I just feel like it's going to be a glut soon on solar cells and electric vehicles. Everybody's throwing money at building this electric vehicle thing. So you have the Chinese throwing it at their folks using subsidies land, control rights, engineering. The Vietnamese are throwing money into this as well. The Americans are throwing money into this. And there's only so many vehicles we're going to buy at a time. So the same for solar cells as well, to some extent, and batteries. There's going to be a huge industrial overproduction glut at some point because nobody wants to let somebody else win the industry. So we're all going to build industrial capacity. And then solar cells and motorbikes, electric motorbikes, and basic electric cars will become very cheap. It's going to become a price war. Yeah, it'll follow most things, which is consolidation. Oh, now see, so this is the real <laughs> issue, right? There's going to be a price war <laughs> soon, then all consumers benefit. Consolidation. That's such a nice word, right? Yeah, so, and consolidation. It was trying to sound more friendly, but when you're looking at EV, other than just what you said earlier, competing with not just China, Chinese finished products, but also the supply chain is always questioning as the market grows, as in GDP per capita rises, that means you're going to have new wealth class. You're going to have new people joining the middle upper class. And then you're going to have different problems with that different uh, consumer appetite. You as a founder or you as a company, can you adjust to that market? Again, your only job in life is product market fit. Your only job is ensuring that your market buys your product for more than what you spend on it. Literally just business 101. So the question will become, as it keeps going, can you continuously adjust to that new market? Because in the end, it might be a price war, but as per usual, it does mean that with more sophisticated consumers, they will ask for more sophisticated things. They will have different needs. They will look for different things. And so the question will just be, then how do you leverage that? How do you become a different player? This sector is really good for people who are entrepreneurial, but not necessarily the rewards may not go to entrepreneurs in that sense that if you're looking at this, there's a lot of growth. So if you're be entrepreneurial, you're willing to be an executive, you're willing to figure out partnerships. This is an exciting way to save the world and honestly make money and change customer behavior. And Southeast Asia is well primed to adopt it more over the next 50 years. I just think that to create yeah, a pure and, uh, play startup competing with incumbents who are busy aggressively transforming and the industrial ecosystems, it requires you to be a lot savvier, a lot more cunning, I would say, about what this process is going to be. Yeah, I also don't want to discount the real environmental effect of this. As in, if we even think about the idea of having low emission zones in Jakarta and anyone who lives here understands the air pollution problem, then you would realize that maybe it is nice to have, you know, a lot of electric vehicle in the market because at least in these low emission zones where only EV vehicles, for example, can be there for certain amounts of time, I can breathe better. Those are real public health benefits that you can put a value on. You can know how much it affects people. But again, the question becomes, you as a player, how are you going to position yourself so that you're not just having a hope for how big the market is globally, but also you yourself knowing that your competitor is not domestic, that is the rest of the world. Yeah, and it's a tricky part because I think it's underweight on how much America is throwing money into yeah, existing automobile manufacturers to transform. But also as people are underweight how much China is pushing manufacturers to move their manufacturing value chain overseas. And it's really interesting because we previously talked about how TikTok, the algorithm is banned for export, but China is totally okay with manufacturing going overseas. And so it's part of the industrial policy. And I don't think it's necessarily a win-lose China thing. I don't think, but I think you just have to realize that if you're competing, just the gravity that's happening. Yeah, correct. I don't necessarily think the entire market is just going to be taken over by one player. But that's also not very realistic. It's possible that several players might be the dominant ones. But again, as a new player, just understanding, like what you said, the gravity of the situation. Yeah. And the Chinese manufacturers is not China. It's also multiple players within China and they're fighting each other to the death. They want to cut deals with local players before you cut a deal with their competitor in China who's also moving the stuff out. Sometimes in the media, it makes it like US, China as if it's one specific player. But when you look at the US, we know there's Ford, GM, there's multiple players and they're competing with each other. 
And so even though Chinese industrial export policy is that we want to move the value chain overall outside, we don't want to veto it, we want to encourage it. But conversely, if you're savvy, there are multiple partnerships to be built with the right player at the right time that wants to move that chain out. Yeah. When you're looking again at these questions, as you said, so China's there exporting, it's a value chain, but then the US is having protectionist policy. This is why you can't really swipe with a broad brush that you should only do protectionist policies or you should only do this because each country will just have different national policies and different vision and goals. And so as a founder, you need to understand the macros. Like you need to understand what is going on in your region and also what market you are making things for. And that requires, as we talked about in a previous episode, the importance of having a public policy person. If you are building things that rely a lot on public policy, yeah. which is lots of stuff. So if you're doing fintech, if you're doing EV, if you're doing solar, those are all very reliant on public policy. So at what stage in your business do you think it's wise to start having a public policy specialist? Yeah. And I think it's interesting because like you said, if you're doing SaaS or fast fashion, then you probably are not facing a massive amount of industrial policy in the sectors. And so the need for Unless you you're in EU. Yeah, I guess so. Or well, maybe textile manufacturing maybe as well. There are different angles of what yeah. that looks like. But yes. But yeah. And it's interesting because we saw the Apple car died, but then now we have the Xiaomi and they're coming out. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. It'll be great just to see how the entire industry starts growing and thriving and which ways they take turns. But as you say... You also have to be more savvy, especially if you're a new company or you're a new founder or you're just someone new in the ecosystem. Learn where your region is, what are what is your region doing in terms of policies, and maybe consider that if you're in a region where you may not have the economic power in your domestic market to really play and just feed that, then maybe you need to collaborate more, or maybe that means you need to think of other ways to work together with larger players. Yeah, yes, hundred percent. And spot on, which is that it goes back to your call is there is a lot of local approaches to differentiate and cover a niche in the overall ecosystem. And you just have to be aware that you replace the entire ecosystem and you'd be aware of the public policy aspects of it. Also, replacing an entire ecosystem is hard. Yeah. On that note, when you think about the future about this ecosystem within Southeast Asia, do you have any predictions or things that and think about? Yeah, for Southeast Asia, there's a lot of information already on how will boom, especially EV adoption. It's just the timeline might be longer than people. And a lot of it has to go back down to fundamentals, which is your GDP per capita, how much can people spend certain markets, for example, Indonesia, where there's just a lot more two-wheel adoption that's possible simply because that's currently what the majority is. It's two-wheel vehicles. But again, it goes back to you always need to know your market need and your market need, even if it's a country that is go growing from lower income to a high income country, that means they still will be price sensitive. And the question becomes, oh, but EB, you don't need to keep buying gas, but this is consumer psychology. It is very hard to actually make people think on a longer term when it comes to certain types of spending. If on overall, the just is a much higher price from the get-go, even with subsidies, unless that subsidy really does make a difference and make it on par, then it is a harder argument. So again, just know the market that you're in, know the reality of it, and not just always make stuff for the next, oh, this will be good in five years, but also think about how is it going to add value at least in the next several years, and then gear the infrastructure and the entire ecosystem of your company to be able to be flexible enough to move with that market as the market moves up in terms of GDP per capita. For myself, to wrap up the episode, prediction is that the winning Southeast Asian companies will be hybrids of all the various knowledge of Chinese, American, Southeast Asian, local insight. And you look at that bike in Vietnam, you look at Stick EV, both of them basically using and localizing in Thailand or Vietnam. They're using Chinese pieces. They are assembling using local labor. A lot of their founders are US educated. There's going to be an interesting mind meld. And what I'm trying to say here is that my prediction is that the Chinese are obviously going to look at it from a Chinese lens and Americans are going to look at it from an American lens. And the media is going to portray it as a country level. The winning strategy for a Southeast Asian founder or entrepreneurial team or startup is to say, hey, forget about all this hate and all the headlines. Like I said, how do we nail what Gita just said, which is the lowest cost price at the most awesome experience and the most easy way to buy? And 
you just bag, borrow, steal all the various pieces in whatever form or fashion, regardless of headline or patriotism, whatever it is. And then that probably will end up being the winning combination. On that note, see you, Gita. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.